This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the world. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash eyebrowcinema. On August 7th, 2021, film magazine Little White Lies published an essay titled I Met a Film Bro, Here's What I Learned, wherein the author describes her meeting with a male screenwriter whom she diagnoses a film bro for his dismissive attitude of women-led films. If you haven't heard the term before, film bro is a popular online phrase which denotes a certain type of male movie buff who privileges dark stories of violent men as the pinnacle of cinema. An attitude which, according to this article, demonstrates a shallow, male-centric cinephilia. The author goes on to explore the etymology of the word bro, break down the film bro into three subcategories, and finally concludes that this hypothetical abstraction of a cinema-goer is starting to disappear due to a greater diversity in front of and behind the camera. It's not a very good essay. The cornerstone of the author's thesis is rooted in one anecdotal experience only tenuously connected to the subcategories of film bro they provide, which are themselves not backed by evidence or even arguments. Unpacking the history of the word bro is, by the essay's own admission, largely pointless, and while the issues the author raises regarding sexism and lack of diversity in the movie business are valid, they are not adequately connected to the film bro as a concept. But despite this essay's many shortcomings, I still find myself somewhat in agreement with its ending. I do think that the film bro is disappearing, not because of more diverse films or the hashtag MeToo movement, but because persistent misuse of the term film bro online has rendered the title entirely meaningless. Whatever specificity the concept first held as a critique of limited masculine film diets has been washed away by broad applications which define film bro movie to mean anything that's vaguely pretentious and a tendency for think piece writers to decry the films rather than the attitudes of the bros themselves. And this is what I'd like to explore today. What exactly is the film bro? Why is he significant? And how has the term mutated over the years? The first thing we need to do is define film bro. Watch it, jerk. The closest thing to a credible definition comes to us by way of Urban Dictionary, and has been quoted frequently in many of the essays and think pieces on the topic. A film bro is a person who views themselves as a huge film nerd while having mostly surface level knowledge of movies. A second definition offered, though admittedly a less popular one and far less frequently cited, describes the film bro as an arrogant and often condescending person who pretends to know a lot about film, but actually only appreciates movies with visual panache and no narrative depth. This starts to get to the core of the film bro, someone who believes themselves an expert when in fact they have a relatively narrow framework for cinema. But to really get to the essence of the film bro, we need to identify which films make up the film bro canon. It's hard to do this with any scientific accuracy. As these definitions suggest, the term itself is a pejorative, not something self-appointed. There's no council of film bros who can curate a list of titles which compose their cinephilia. Instead, we'll have to look at the lists and listicles found on places like BuzzFeed or Letterboxd, as well as what movies are frequently referenced in articles on the film bro. I've linked a lot of these in the description, but to summarize, the most common films which appear are lots of Tarantino, but especially Pulp Fiction, lots of David Fincher, but especially Fight Club, and lots of Christopher Nolan, but especially The Dark Knight. Other recurring films include Goodfellas, Scarface, Drive, American Psycho, The Wolf of Wall Street, Taxi Driver, Blade Runner, Donnie Darko, The Silence of the Lambs, A Clockwork Orange, and The Godfather, just to name a few. From these results, we can identify some dominant trends within the film bro canon. These are movies about masculinity. It's not just that the protagonists are usually dudes, but the stories are explicitly about how men behave in society. Is that what a man looks like? <laughs> to that end, these are violent movies. The characters are typically defined in part by their capacity for violence, and the films will frequently revel in violent acts. The films are also cool. Coolness isn't really something we can measure, but over and over, we see in the film bro canon protagonists who, 
no matter how terrible, have a certain glamour and appeal, and filmmaking choices which have an almost intoxicating effect. Not just cool though, the films are morally dubious too. Lines of good and evil are not so clearly delineated, with protagonists who are often openly immoral, but still likable anyway. And finally, these are movies that a lot of burgeoning film buffs discover when they're still a teenager. That last point is essential in understanding the appeal of the prototypical film bro movie. Much as it's easy to scoff at a lot of these films as entry-level texts to the wider world of cinema, it's also easy to forget how profound those experiences can be the first time, especially when your knowledge of film is still relatively limited. Most of us grow up on a steady diet of kids' movies and four-quadrant entertainments that are ostensibly more adult, but still fall pretty firmly within age-appropriate viewing. Consequently, it's exciting the first time you see a movie which treats you like an adult. There's an illicit pleasure to the violence of a Pulp Fiction or a Goodfellas. Not just the visceral thrill of action, but the knowledge that you're not really supposed to be watching this. It isn't just violence though. A lot of kids get exposed to R-rated action and horror movies well before the MPAA would approve after all. But such films still generally adhere to an uncomplicated worldview of clearly defined heroes and villains. Morality in the film bro canon is more uncertain, with the movies trusting the viewer to be able to navigate the ethical questions raised without being handheld. Whether a young viewer actually can navigate those questions varies. If the closest thing to a complex antagonist you've seen from the movies is Thanos, it's hard to know what to make of Tyler Durden. What is this? This is a chemical burn. <laughs> On the one hand, Tyler is clearly the villain of Fight Club. It's his plan the protagonist is attempting to thwart in the movie's third act, and the character is more generally a violent and self-destructive person who brainwashes people into his death cult. But on the other hand, he also does make some valid points about the hollowness of consumer culture, and does provide a sense of kinship and community that the lonely narrator was previously lacking. And crucially, the film doesn't distinguish when Tyler says something insightful the things you own end up owning you. From when he says something violent or misogynistic. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. This makes the film more challenging, but also more rewarding. Part of Fight Club's appeal is that it doesn't become an after-school special, which needs to spell out right and wrong for the audience. Viewers are expected to judge actions for themselves, based on their consequences within the story, and based on the inherent values embedded within. And to be sure, some viewers may well draw the wrong conclusions, seeing Tyler not as a critique or cautionary warning of the dangers of toxic masculinity, but as a cool alpha who was totally right, bro. There's a popular meme dedicated to this entire phenomenon, in fact. And it's true. You are missing the point if you idolize Tyler Durden, but it's also a mistake to view Fight Club in terms of adulation. The movie, like many in the film bro canon, doesn't lecture the viewer on the right way to think and feel. Complementing the more adult themes and lack of didactic storytelling are unique filmmaking styles. Most of the film bro canon is composed of auteurist filmmakers whose personality reverberates in every frame of their work. If you know your film history, you'll be able to trace the influences on directors like Fincher or Tarantino. But remember, we're talking about teenagers being exposed to a wider world of film for the first time, who won't likely have that context. And that first exposure can be revelatory. I distinctly remember the first time I saw A Clockwork Orange, and being shocked. By the violence, yes, but even more so, by the film's aesthetic. I had no idea a movie could look and sound like this. It was enthralling to me. The viewing sparked a love for Stanley Kubrick movies, but also a deeper appreciation for filmmaking as an art form, with its own means of expression. And to be sure, Kubrick is hardly an obscure name in cinema, but that's also part of the point. A sixth component that ties the film bro canon together 
is that the movies tend to be pretty popular and well-known. The films are not only easy enough to access, whether through physical media or streaming or even just showing up on TV, but they also have built-in communities which already love them. Anyone who sees their first Kubrick or Scorsese or Tarantino can easily find a trove of affinity for their films online and even in person. That shared enthusiasm helps foster and cultivate a fanbase, which in turn perpetuates the cycle. All told, I think this gives us a good overview of who the film bro is, what his favorite movies are, and why those movies resonate so profoundly. But this is also a very optimistic overview, oriented around discovery and growth. Why then has the film bro emerged as such an innately negative concept? So what if a bunch of teen boys and young men are a little too into Tarantino movies? Where's the harm? The most common response is that the behaviors of the film bro are toxic, that he's rude, condescending, and dismissive. Claims like this are hard to verify though, given there's no scientific study of film bros. Each writer on this subject is drawing on their own highly personal experiences with male film fans and projecting those traits into a vague abstraction. That's not to say there's no truth to the accusations. I can certainly recognize film bro -y behavior in my own teenage years, and I've also caught glimmers of said attitudes in my time working for a university film program. Misogynistic dogpiles are also common on social media sites, and there are even articles like the New York Post's rather infamous piece on how women aren't capable of understanding Goodfellas because it's too much of a manly man movie. Then again, that article was rather uniformly trashed and ripped apart by virtually everyone who's written about it, so it'd be a mistake to view this attitude as the prevailing belief. Moreover, while smug condescension and belittlement of others are bad behaviors found within film communities which should be called out and challenged, they're also not unique to film bros. Every fan-driven community has their share of arrogant jerks who think a little too highly of themselves and a little too low of those they disagree with. Those qualities are often manifested through film bros, but they're not intrinsic to him. What is intrinsic to the film bro is a certain narrow-mindedness. Much as I've outlined the film bro canon as profoundly touching, and as much as I personally love many of the films included, this is ultimately a limited sample of what cinema is. It's not a matter of the films being bad, or that you're wrong if they're your favorites, but that there are experiences the film bro canon doesn't make space for. We've already outlined what the film bro movie is, let's talk about what the film bro movie isn't. For one thing, it isn't feminine. That's not to say there's no place for women heroes or women directors even, but only if the work in some way aligns with more traditionally masculine coded genres and stories. And at the risk of launching into a long diatribe about gender binaries, I'm not saying women can't enjoy action movies or gangster films. But what I am saying is that the film bro canon doesn't leave room for stories associated with femininity, whether that be narratives exploring the lives of women or genres like period romances or romantic comedies. The film bro canon is also very white. Directors like Spike Lee or films like Menace to Society are just as overflowing with auteur personality and just as bound by issues of masculinity and violence but they're featured far less frequently in film bro lists. There aren't many foreign language films either. Occasionally a slick and hyper-violent genre movie like Old Boy will sneak in there, but quieter and more introspective bits of world cinema fall to the wayside. To that end, the film bro cinema is primarily a modern cinema, prioritizing films from the 90s on especially. The oldest movie I came across on any film bro list was The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, but other movies from the 60s are scarce, and anything before that is basically non-existent. But why not? Certainly classic Hollywood is just as cool as anything in Tarantino. Surely filmmakers like Akira Kurosawa or Igmar Bergman are just as interested in masculinity as Fincher or Paul Thomas Anderson. These omissions make sense when you remember the film bro is usually a younger filmgoer just beginning their journey into a wider world of cinema. 
Most of the essential film bro titles are more challenging than your average Hollywood movie, but not so challenging that they're likely to become alienating. Directors like Tarantino or Nolan or Fincher hit this perfect sweet spot, wherein their movies blend personal expression and unique storytelling with the thrills and excitement of slick Hollywood production. But older movies, movies from other countries, movies which explore the lives of women or people of color, ask a little more from the viewer. That's not to say these films aren't also extremely entertaining. They are, but they require a bit more work to fully appreciate. Many film bros will eventually make that leap and start to explore movies that do ask a little more of them. But others never will go much further, and that is the central flaw of the film bro. His cinematic canon ultimately consists of a rudimentary sampling of film history with massive blind spots. But the person who loses out the most from these limitations is really the film bro himself. He's the one shutting himself off from new pleasures. This is something I can directly relate to. I remember watching The Apartment for the first time, at the height of my film bro years, and thinking that it was really good, but not quite great. I mean, it was a cute movie and all, but it was also a romantic comedy. The real best movies of 1960 tackled more important topics, like murder, or war, or Italians. It took me a few years to realize that not only was The Apartment a great movie, it was also one of my favorite movies. Abiding to macho ideas about what stories counted as important only restricted my own enjoyment. As annoying or as obnoxious as the film bro can get, the main person he's hurting is really himself. This is not reflected in the various think pieces dissecting the topic. To go by these essays, the film bro is a menace, but more than a menace, He's the defining menace of our modern media. You know him, and you don't like him very much, and you zoned out while he explained the genius of his favorite director for you, the film bro. The film bro has become an invasive species. These pests have soured a whole slew of film lovers, turning the cinematic conversation straight toward toxicity. All of his usually misogynist opinions are validated through the narrative of his favorite films. Among the perpetrators of this subtle bias lurks a creature so dangerous yet so elusive. This creature is the film bro. He idolizes the problematic male protagonist of American Psycho, Fight Club, and A Clockwork Orange. He's probably partly responsible for the onslaught of think pieces about the perceived dangers of Joker. These film bros, while being annoying and fun to make fun of, are holding on to an idea of what film should be. They dictate what is art. We'll just have to keep zoning out every time our bro opens his mouth and wait for his reign to come to an end. Damn, I had no idea obsessively quoting Tyler Durden granted you so much power. I'm being glib here, mostly because I think treating obnoxious film nerds like they're these almighty tyrants is hilariously silly. But I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge most of these essays do at least speak to legitimate concerns. The film industry is indeed patriarchal. Men control most of the power behind the scenes, key creative and executive positions are disproportionately filled by men, and masculine stories tend to be regarded as more important than stories about women. And the last several years have foregrounded the rampancy of sexual harassment women in Hollywood face. These are all very real problems that should be taken seriously, but it's misleading to pin these problems on the film bro. Teenage and college-aged film bros don't hold industrial power. They don't have any say in who gets to work in Hollywood or which stories get greenlit. Worse yet is the implication made by Little White Lies that the sexual violence of men like James Franco or Army Hammer are reflective of the threat film bros pose to women. I don't think I should have to say this, but implying that guys being smug about Tarantino movies is comparable to alleged sex criminals is wildly inappropriate. The film bro is not responsible for the sexist film industry, though some of his values may be in part a product of it. 
The one issue outlined which does directly speak to the film bro is the tendency to value movies about men more than movies about women. This is a cornerstone of film bro cinephilia and reflective of a larger failing in film culture, but it's also far more complex than a question of consumer tastes. Towards the end of The Little White Lies piece, the author cites Nomadland, an intimate portrayal of female subjectivity directed by a woman winning the Best Picture Oscar as a positive step towards a more inclusive movie business. More historically significant still was Chloe Zhao's Best Director win, at the time only the second woman to win Best Director and the only woman of color to do so. This is a significant achievement, and a well-deserved one in my opinion but it too still exists within the patriarchal confines of American movies. Three women so far have won the Best Directing Oscar, all three working within genres traditionally associated with men. War movies and westerns, with The Hurt Locker and The Power of the Dog being overt explorations of masculinity and its intersections with violence. Nomadland does foreground a woman's story, but the film still exists within a neo-western space, with substantial writing on Zhao's work analyzing how a Chinese woman has reimagined the American West. None of this is meant to criticize any of these women or their work. Quite the contrary, I love all three of these movies. The Hurt Locker is the only Best Picture winner which ends with industrial metal on the soundtrack, that automatically makes it one of the better ones. But it's not a coincidence that the three women who have won directing Oscars have done so in traditionally masculine genres. Movies about war are more important than movies about love. Cowboys more praiseworthy than grandmas and granddaughters. The much-referenced Little White Lies essay betrays the same gender bias when the author claims female-led films are no longer relegated to the realm of rom-coms and family dramas as if rom-coms and family dramas are inherently less worthy. The disrespect toward a feminine cinema is far more deeply ingrained within culture than the viewing habits of teenage film nerds. Amidst critiques of the toxicity of the film bro also lay rejection of the film bro texts themselves. Nowhere is this more explicitly stated than in the essay on examination of the bro in our film culture, whose second paragraph begins by stating, Fight Club and Pulp Fiction are somewhat of a joke, specifically because of their association with film bro culture. This is not a wholly unique phenomenon. Similar associations exist for properties like Star Wars or Rick and Morty, wherein the ugliest of fandoms have tarnished perceptions of the work itself. This is an unfair judgment, one which erases the fact that many of the film bro texts are far more complex and nuanced. I'm sure some of you winced at the classification of Mary Heron's scathing portrait of Wall Street's greed and sociopathic violence as bro cinema, or Blade Runner's quiet rumination on poverty and societal collapse as entertainment for frat guys. Martin Scorsese is often held up as a patron saint of film bro cinema, ignoring a women's picture like Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore or a repressed romance like The Age of Innocence, or his unofficial trilogy of spiritual epics. Oh yeah, I'm a film bro. I saw Kundun twice in theaters. Kundun! I liked it! Hell, even Scorsese's most commonly cited film bro movie is significant for the space it gives to a woman's perspective, a rarity in the gangster genre. This isn't to say the film bro canon is unimpeachable, but that viewing said films from such a limiting prism is inherently reductive. Take, for example, Lithium Magazine's essay, How Critics Created the Film Bro, wherein the author spends several paragraphs outlining why he hates Pulp Fiction. Let's talk about the one movie whose title we've all come to groan at, Tarantino's 1994 classic, Pulp Fiction. I use quotes around classic because, in all honesty, it shouldn't really be considered one of the greats, it's just not that good. Now, the fact that the writer doesn't like the film is not a problem, but I find the author's reasons for dismissing Pulp Fiction revealing, particularly when he summarizes the story as boiling down to two things. One, violence is the pinnacle of entertainment. Two, women are sexy. 
love or hate the movie, this take is wrong. Point A, while Pulp Fiction is a violent movie, and said violence is a key aspect of its appeal, Stop it. it's not an action film. Actual moments of on-screen violence are brief, with more of the film composed of people talking than it is bullets and bloodshed. It'd be more accurate to say the film presents dialogue as the pinnacle of entertainment. Then there's the film's ending, where the whole point is that Jules spares Ringo and Yolanda's lives, choosing to make peace rather than inflict violence. As for point B, the most substantial woman character in the film is Mia Wallace. And yeah, I suppose she is pretty sexy, but that doesn't come from a voyeuristic camera which fetishizes or exploits her body, it comes from her allure. Uma Thurman projects such confidence and this indefinable sense of cool that you just hang off her every word. It's telling that the first aspect of Mia we're introduced to is her voice. Hi, Vincent. I'm getting dressed. The door's open. Come inside and make yourself a drink. Mia. Even when the camera does begin to highlight her body, the first part which gets attention is her mouth speaking into an intercom. Again, we see Tarantino's love of talking. Moreover, as with Jules, much of Mia's story is about unraveling her persona. She begins the night as a mysterious ingenue, but that mystique is shattered after her near-fatal overdose, a sequence which is about as far from sexy as one can get. She and Vincent do ultimately reach a point of intimacy, but it isn't sexual, or even really romantic, so much as it is a bond forged by shared vulnerability. And what about the other women in the film? Yolanda, with her mix of tender love and frenzied intensity, Jody's sarcastic drawl, Fabian's timidness, these characters are a far cry from the one-dimensional sex objects Lithium's essay implies. That's not to say there aren't criticisms one could make of Pulp Fiction's representation of either violence or women, but the binary set up by this essay is incredibly simplistic and reductive. These misreadings stem from the fact that the author isn't really writing about Pulp Fiction, he's writing about an imagined version of Pulp Fiction, bound by a projection of film bro culture. If the film bro is conceptualized as a violent misogynist, then surely his movies must be too. But the critique doesn't hold up, because it doesn't actually engage with the text. The conclusions are drawn based on the assumptions the writer already has, rather than what the work is actually doing. This is the peril with blanketly labeling a slew of movies as film bro. Detail and nuance are elided, and all that remains is a hollow shell. Just as the film bro canon has been misrepresented by strawman critiques, the parameters of what qualifies as a film bro movie have also begun to shift. While the essays cited throughout this video have generally explored the concept of film bro more or less consistently, his films largely adhering to the qualities noted earlier, use of the phrase on social media is a lot less precise. Of particular note are two viral TikTok videos, one which teased film bros for not understanding why someone would rather watch a Marvel film and not a two-hour black and white movie about the Serbian government shown from the eyes of a pigeon. The other a video where the host presents a list of ways to annoy a film bro, mostly by saying things like how you don't understand David Lynch movies or how you prefer anime dubs to subtitles. I don't want to overemphasize these videos given they are intended as jokes, the second video is even presented as a series of troll tactics, but the selection of movies defined as film bro is revealing. Amidst the usual suspects of Tarantino or Drive, we also have movies like Roma, a slow burn character study exploring the intersections of class and indigeneity in 1970s Mexico. In the Mood for Love, a story of repressed emotions and unconsummated longing. And the Before Trilogy, a decade spanning series examining the ecstasy, agony, and mundanity of romantic love. Strangest of all, though, is the declaration that Studio Ghibli movies are film bro cinema. Yes, the same Ghibli that makes whimsical fantasy adventures primarily aimed at children. You'll notice we're miles away from the hyper-masculine, hyper-violent stories we've been discussing so far. These movies have a more delicate tone, a greater focus on intimacy, 
on overt interest in the interior lives of women. They aren't really film bro movies as the concept has previously been defined. Granted, a lack of stability and meaning has arguably always been an aspect of the film bro. In researching various lists when putting this video together, I was always surprised when I'd come across something like Die Hard or Saving Private Ryan. Violent and masculine movies to be sure, but also straightforward action movies with little in the way of edge or moral ambiguity. These strike me much more as film dad than they do film bro. The last line of the much cited Urban Dictionary definition cites the film bro as, quote, adoring the MCU, which seems a rather dated sentiment given the line drawn by Scorsese between cinema and Marvel. To some extent, the film bro has never been an entirely consistent concept, but I'm less interested in calling something like Roma out as not being a real film bro movie than I am identifying how the parameters of film bro have shifted. In the context of social media posts like these TikToks, film bro doesn't refer to any specific quality about the movies beyond a vague idea of being pretentious. Any movie that might be perceived as snobby or elitist qualifies as film bro. This is most evident in the hypothetical pigeon movie. The joke here isn't that the film bro likes aggressively macho or edgelord movies, it's that he likes esoteric art films more than franchise entertainment. Now, the charitable reading of this definition is that being anti-film bro means being anti-elitism and pro-populist entertainment. The less charitable reading is that being anti-film bro is a form of anti-intellectualism. Not because the film bro brain is simply too vast to comprehend, but because the movies defined as film bro are the ones which require a little more work. Non-narrative movies, movies from a foreign culture or in black and white, or even just movies that aren't striving for simplistic escapism, but instead ask for a little introspection, are dismissed. Why watch an esoteric art film when you could just watch a Marvel movie? Why watch Studio Ghibli when you could just watch Disney? If the parameters for what counts as film bro are indeed this wide, then I do believe the concept is dead. Any attempt at a criticism of gender biases or arrogant behaviors have eroded away as, like gaslighting before it, overuse on the internet has diffused the term of its original meaning. What I find ironic, though, is how this diffusion of meaning reflects the film bro's first sin. Just as the hypothetical film bro held to a reductive idea of cinema, the anti-film bro attitude demonstrates a similar lack of curiosity, one that is outright dismissive of new experiences from the movies. This is what frustrates me so much about film bro discourse, the sheer disinterest in movies themselves. Whether it's film bros who aren't interested in stories about anyone other than violent dudes, reductive dismissal of great art just because film bros like it, or suspicion of any movies that seek to challenge or provoke, it's disheartening to see. And that attitude is something we saw a lot this Oscar season, where the running joke has been how adult-oriented movies are boring and no one wants to see them. Because like the Oscars, it's never like shit that I've seen. They're never like, and the nominees are Transformers. Seen it. Fast and Furious, seen it. Matrix, unfortunately seen it. New experiences at the movies are met with defense. It's like these movies are the vegetables of movies. Not intrigue. My only retort is to return to something Scorsese once said regarding the importance of studying the old masters of filmmaking. His reasoning wasn't concerned with adhering to the traditions of cinema or paying respect, but with broadening one's own perspective. In his words, I still consider myself a student. Um, the more pictures I've made in the past 20 years, the more I realize I really don't know. And I'm always looking for something to, something or someone that I could, that I could learn from. Study the old masters, enrich your palette, expand the canvas. There's always so much more to learn. You said it, bro. Thank you to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service where you can watch some of the most beautiful and incredible works of cinema from around the world. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. And these movies don't come from a faceless algorithm, but are hand-picked by actual human beings. 
It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. If you're the sort of person who strives for new experiences from the movies, I'd highly recommend Tangerine, a story of transgender sex workers that is cinematically exhilarating, tender, and heartfelt. And the best part, you can watch it and a whole host of amazing cinema for free right now. Just head to movie.com slash eyebrow cinema for a free 30 days. That's a whole month of great cinema for free.